at UNC that was called environmental politics and it was in the geography department and honestly I don't remember a lot from the class <laughs> like there was a lot of readings that we had to go through but there was something like from the beginning that I do sort of remember and it was about how how do we view trash and how do we view mm. filth um and there's like a number of ways that like we we think of filth like when I hear filth I think of like poop to be honest <laughs> like I know that's like the very g-rated <laughs> okay, <laughs> g-rated word of it but like you know like you you like you flush it you try to get rid of it right you don't want anything on you um like like it's something that you try to put away it's mm -hmm. something that you kind of manage it's something that's dirty yeah. that can stain you that smells and that that's one way of like we just get rid of waste another is that like we try to put waste in a way where we don't have to see it right. like the trash like we throw trash out um like it's out of place like if if there's trash if your room is trashy like it has to be cleaned and mm -hmm. something has to be waste is like a hazard like if you yes. can't get like sure. like watching hoarders yo like <laughs> when you watch it you're like Ugh. like 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 and they also say like there's so much there's so much stuff here like you can't get out of here like mm -hmm. it's it's dangerous like like filth and trash at a point becomes like a hazard yes sure. um so you're probably wondering why i brought all that all that stuff up good listeners <laughs> <laughs> who are listening to this and and it's gonna be it's gonna be clear as we go along but just think of these themes of how do we associate trash and how do we associate um waste but that was what we like to call a cold open <laughs> <laughs> and now we can actually introduce who we have here so my name is Anna Yancey or Anna if we call Anna on here and, and I'm, here with I'm your other host Gabe and today we have a special guest uh, oh. Dr. Gabriela Vabivia who is in the Department of Geography here at UNC um, her work focuses mainly on the politics of environmental resources especially in Latin America um, specifically on the experience of everyday living while the oil industrial complex with the okay <laughs> <laughs> you know how you yeah you yeah. can just you, know what? you introduce me <laughs> strata hi hi there hi yes i'm gabriela valdivia and i am in the department of geography and my work is a lot about waste disposal mm -hmm. but in relation to the oil complex in ecuador and i do uh, study a lot of social movements in latin america related to environmental politics fantastic mm -hmm. so thank you for being here yeah thank you for the invitation mm -hmm. We have an expert here today. Yes. So it's very exciting. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. Like, I'm like, yay. Um, sorry. Uh, so <laughs> today we're actually talking about environmental justice. So what is environmental justice? What do you guys think of when you hear that sort of title? Well, for me, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, like making sure people have clean water. The first a lot in the news in the past couple of years, you've been hearing the word environmental justice associated with things like um, the Dakota Access Pipeline mm. and Standing Rock yeah. um, and the situation there. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I think of the two words, mm -hmm. environment and justice, and sort of how they come, connect, come to be connected. And uh, in a lot of the work that I've done, environment is a place where you live so the mm. story about poop right <laughs> it makes a lot of sense because it's uh, the place where you live and how you keep it together and how you connect to it and how you have these interdependence with place so um it's questions about justice are questions of ethics how we mm -hmm. should live in that place as well as moral how we should be living in that place right um so the justice element is about that question of is it ethical? Is it positive? Mm. Is it mm. leading to well-being? Mm. Fantastic breakdown. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I yeah, love that's that. great. <laughs> um, so, I like that. I like that with words, also with social justice. Like mm -hmm. you get, um, 
you get uh, different associations that people have with it. But unlike with social justice, where it's very hard to find a definition, at least we have the EPA, the <laughs> wonderful EPA, who points to... Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not being sarcastic at all. Um, How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, but, but the EPA does have a definition for environmental justice, yeah. and it says the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of everyone, regardless of identity, in the environmental law and decision-making process. Um, so the history of environmental justice is very interesting in that it started in North Carolina, um, yeah. which is like cool, but also why do we have so many environmental justice issues that we can actually point to as we go along with yeah. the episode? But um, it's widely cited that, well, in 1982, this is like the inciting incident that most people have uh, for the start of environmental justice, is that North Carolina proposed a plan to move contaminated soil from like roadsides to a landfill located in Warren County, which is a mm -hmm. predominantly and historically black county. Mm -hmm. And so protests began in response to this plan and about 120 people were arrested, mm -hmm. including like a congressman who's from DC who came yeah. down and like joined the protest as well. Mm -hmm. And so this was the first environmental protest by people of color that garnered national attention in the United States. Although to yeah. be fair, there were definitely like little pockets of like protests before this moment. Yeah, um, I mean, like you think about the environmental movements of like the sixties and things with um, the sort of, you know, the tree hugger cliche and stuff. Yeah. Um, but this was a real turning point um, because it brought the attention of, of people of color um, really, or it brought the, the voices of people of color really to the forefront, which was really awesome. But unfortunately, um, the um, waste was still um, moved to, to that area. And as a result, lots of people got really sick because the chemical itself was called um, PCBs. And I don't know how to pronounce the actual, the actual. <laughs> the actual <laughs> name of that. Um, but contamination in the soil um, and that um, runoff can lead to contamination of the water which can uh, cause a lot of people symptoms like respiratory illnesses mm. and um, rashes. And um, if it's if a um, pregnant person um, is infected with, with the contaminant, that can be really detrimental for the development of the fetus. Um, so a lot of like really major problems. That, again, this is a low income area. Um, mm. It's not exactly an area where people have the resources to deal with those sorts of problems. And we're going to... I was just going to say that, yes, it it, it was a, a one of those moments that brought national attention to, mm. um, to the disposal of toxic waste and to the emphasis on uh, individual polluters as being responsible but not being legally bind, bound mm. to uh, where they were disposing of, of uh, the pollutants. Um, and yes, it... Uh, it, it was a community that was mainly um, a black community, but there were all. It was also significant, a significant movement because it formed coalitions that transgressed mm -hmm. racial divides. Even though towards the end, as it as it really gained national uh, level attention, it was it was less so. But at its grassroots origins, there were everybody mm -hmm. that lived yeah. in this community was affected, and it was one of those moments where it was we need to be bound together in mm. order to be able to make this visible and to state our, our make it visible to the state and nationally that this is happening. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and I also like that um, what we're both kind of touching on is that there were environmental movements before mm. then that did not highlight people of color at all. Like, mm. the, like the first uh, environmental movements, like we, like you said, like tree huggers, <laughs> there's like conservation mm -hmm. and like, protecting things that are beautiful mm -hmm. and protecting things that that have value in, in their beauty and mm -hmm. their aesthetics um on top of like also there's like lakes catching on fire like obviously that yeah. needs to be <laughs> like, corrected as well yes but when it started coming down to like that was the first like during the 60s and 70s like that's when we getting like all these environmental like 
Clean Clean Air and Water Act mm-hmm. and the EPA being established at all. Right. But once we start getting into moving into people of color and mm-hmm. environmental racism, um, if to, to just to just give a bit of uh, definition of environmental racism, it's that the powers at be, whoever is like in charge of like allocating where where resources are, waste are, whatever else. Like when when environmental impacts disproportionately affect people of color, mm-hmm. essentially, would be environmental, the definition for environmental racism. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this topic of who, that it took time for people who are usually most impacted by um, environmental injustice, as you said, yeah. is like usually people who don't always have the resources or the mm-hmm. voting power or just the wealth to change to change the conversation. And we do kind of see that now. We see that now globally, um, very recently with the Greta Thunberg, mm-hmm. and there was a picture of like climate activists and one person who was like to the side was cut out of the picture and an AP right. news report, her name is Vanessa Natake, I believe, and she's a climate activist who, uh, I remember she said like, when they cut me out of the picture, they didn't just cut me out, they cut out Africa. Um, right. So she, she, I don't remember exactly what country in Africa that she works within, but um, she's a voice in this mm-hmm. movement, but she was literally cut out yeah. of our, our conversation mm-hmm. about this movement. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's other examples of environmental racism that we can point to And we will point to. (laughs) And we will point to in North Carolina, actually. I think also one of the things uh, to remember, and you both have mentioned, is the generational effects Mm. of these exposures. Um, Because uh, if we're thinking about 1982, right, it's almost four decades since that. And um, communities in Warren Town, and I'm sorry, in Warren uh, Warren County, they still... um, have memories and they still tell stories about yeah. the material and the cultural effects mm-hmm. of having this happening in in their homes and in their where they live, right? Yeah. Um, so and and not only in the memory element, but also in the material effects. Yeah. Like you said, the diseases are usually of a chronic type, mm-hmm. a chronic inflammatory type. From they can range in the effects. Uh, they're manifested through di- as diabetes, mm-hmm. as um, arthritis as presence of other ailments that are not only happening in the generations that are exposed initially right. but also over it's it, their epigenetic effects where mm-hmm. you see some manifestation in the generations that followed that event yeah and i think um like memory memory is something that actually me and me and gabe have been talking about <laughs> recently for yeah. for a future episode yes, we have. but um it's it's like how do you rectify that how will anyone and we can talk about that like once we get to the end of it uh more more to the closing of it but um it's it's how do you hold someone accountable yeah for this and and i think that that really goes to a lot of traumas a lot of injustices as as you said they don't just impact one group of people it is Mm -hmm. generational just like like uh like that them not having resources wealth or whatever else to fight against it is generational Mm -hmm. it's it's and it can be um perpetual as well um unless there's justice environmental justice Mm -hmm. to um bring it bring it to the forefront um so i'm going to talk a little bit more about some other examples of just environmental injustice mm-hmm. in North Carolina. Do you know a lot about the Rogers Road? I have culture? heard some things about it, for sure. Yeah. What um, about, have you heard a little bit about it? Um, so actually, I, I, there's a community center that's actually near this area, and I know some people who work there. And there's, there's like, it's a community center for children mm-hmm. that has like an after-school program. Um, so, so I have a little bit of knowledge on this one. So there's a- In the neighborhood? <laughs> Yeah. 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 So um, this is Rogers Road community. Mm-hmm. And how do I best summarize this? So there was, and I'm trying to make sure I have the best details of this. There was 
conver conversation about kind of similar to the Warren County situation right. of putting a landfill in this particular community and Rogers Road that is also predominantly and a historically black neighborhood mm -hmm. in a historically black area. Um, actually, I have a little bit of detail from the Daily Tar Heel. Uh -huh. Let me say what it has here. Um, the neighborhood traces its roots back over 150 years as black farmers settled in the area after emancipation. And that's also, I think, um, like geography yeah. as far as like the environmental justice issues mm -hmm. also, I think, and that I also say not only predominantly, but historically. Yes. When it's I talk funny. about these communities and that the reason why they settle there isn't just because, oh, there just happens to be a lot of black people here. Right. Like, as far as we're going to talk about Robinson County in a moment, um, and also there's other counties in other areas in North Carolina, but it's specifically for like predominantly or black communities, typically it's people were emancipated yeah. and they bought the land. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, the land when we talk about Robinson County, it wasn't wasn't the best best land for right. for certain purposes. Yeah. Um, what land is going to be sold to to yeah, recently yeah, emancipated not, slave? They're um, not gonna. They're not gonna like, enslaved, So <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so there is a, a fight to place a waste transfer station near right. the neighborhood, and it was. The dump was closed in 2013. But that's another example. Right. And I spoke about Princeville, North Carolina. Have mm -hmm. you heard of that one? This one I know I have not. <laughs> okay. So Princeville is like when I mentioned like buying land and the land. So Princeville, North Carolina, there were also a group of black people who bought the right. land after being emancipated. Mm -hmm. And the land was very flat. It was incredibly flat. Mm, okay. So what do we have in North Carolina? <laughs> you know, like. Like there, there's, there's like, there, you know, they can have names like Irene, Maria, uh, uh, Andrew. Uh, I'm about to sound like totally not a STEM person because I'm about to get tornadoes and hurricanes confused. <laughs> hurricanes. Hurricanes. Yes, tornadoes happen like midway. It's hurricanes. Yes. <laughs> it's one of them. So I haven't taken like, a science class in years. <laughs> Honestly, like, ooh, like, ooh, science, <laughs> ooh. Um, <laughs> We're all humanities majors here. <laughs> except, like, I'm doing an entire, like, well, I'm doing a social science major. Woo That's so social humanities. Science. We had an argument. Anyway. <laughs> God. It's still science. Like, <laughs> Moving on. Anyway. Anyway. It does have sciences in its name. It yeah. Does. There we go. It's still a study. Okay. Okay. Renaissance man Da Vinci did, all right. like, all the, right. okay, all right. Um. But when Hurricane Florence hit yes. this particular area, it's because it's so flat when there's any, like, hurricanes, yeah. it's affected immensely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to... There's no lack of trees and other yeah, it's mountains, like, things to barriers to yeah, stop it's just, flooding and that sort of thing. Um, just just flooding that, that takes place. And, again, it goes back to... They didn't just like, oh, they're just randomly here right. and these things like it's it's part of people who are impacted today. Going back to to what Gabby said is that it's generational. Mm -hmm. Like it's for it's been years that they've lived here and there's no there's nothing being done to to prevent this issue. There's mm -hmm. no there's no. Um, I'm going to use the word reparations, mm -hmm. but there's no like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and one last example of like flat land is I mentioned Robinson County. We've mm -hmm. been talking predominantly about African American communities and historically yeah. African American communities, but in Robinson County there is a large population of Lumbee, mm -hmm. uh, North American Indigenous people, the Native yep. tribe, um, and Lumbee actually had a roommate. Who is who is a Lumbee native, and I actually go to church when I go back to to when I go back home. I go to church in Pembroke, mm -hmm. which is in Robinson County, and um, very flat land mm -hmm. that they live on. But also the the Lumbee tribe is the like huge tribe in North Carolina, like yeah. huge. But they don't have federal recognition, right? So they're not brought up 
a lot. They're not, mm -hmm. they, they don't have some of the same, uh, I'm going to say bargaining rights <laughs> as maybe, <laughs> yeah. as maybe like other more predominant uh, tribes. And so have you all heard of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline? Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. All right. I've been talking for a while. What do you okay. know about the Atlantic Coast Pipeline? Um, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, as far as I, if I'm remembering correctly, it's going through North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia as well. Do they? Mm, they may around? have. They may have changed the movement of it, but I think also um, maybe West it's Virginia. definitely going through North Carolina yeah, and, and Virginia. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be what is it? Um, how many miles long? <laughs> ah, that's a little detail. Anyway, um, um, they've they've changed some of the placing of where the pipeline right. is going to flow through. It was a sixty <laughs> sixty. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, our producer working. 600, 600 miles. 600 miles. I, I was going to say 600 miles, and then I was like, it was like I, 60 miles. I don't want to say it wrong. <laughs> That's why we're not step. We thought yeah. 60 miles. That's long enough. That covers <laughs> all the areas that we talked about. Um, no. <laughs> wow. Woo. 600 miles long pipeline. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, it was originally going to run through Wake County, but mm -hmm. for some reason it moved. Why mm. did it move to suddenly get to Robinson County? Interesting. Who knows? Mm. But um, there has been some talks with with um, Lumbee, Lumbee Native Americans there, mm -hmm. um, like some of the leaders of that community about the pipeline. And there's a lot of promises that the ACP is giving and that oh, it's going to provide so many such jobs and right. it's going to like do this, that, and the other for for this community and it's going to improve the economy, which is always like, I don't want to say always, but it's very promising for a community or for an area that doesn't have right. a lot of that. Who wants to see, yeah. yeah, who wants to see some economic change, who wants to see opportunity be made available. Mm -hmm. um, however, the jobs are, well, like not a lot of jobs, and right. I think and they're specialized jobs, yeah. specialized. And yeah. they're also some of the jobs that could be available for them are temporary right. that, that you don't need to have a lot of specialization in. Mm -hmm. um, also, the environmental concerns of a pipeline was right. also brought up with the Dakota mm -hmm. Access Pipeline as well. Um, of if, if there is some mismanagement mm -hmm. or if any of the oil gets into any waterways, yeah. this, that, and the other. Uh, like I said, it's flat land. There's a lot of hurricanes right. that... There's absolutely the potential of flooding. Especially with, like, damage. We bring up hurricanes, and I, I just get to an aside of, like, there has been more, like, one in a hundred year hurricanes, or one in, like, very, right. like, powerful yeah. hurricanes mm -hmm. uh, occurring more frequently because of of climate change. Well, <laughs> aided by climate change, yeah. aided by um, the earth getting warmer. Mm -hmm. And who is who has the power of resources? Who, ha who is consuming the resources that are most causing climate change? Right. And it's typically the most privileged people yeah. who also are, as we are seeing so far, there are examples mm -hmm. not being held accountable yeah. for the impacts that they are causing. Um, just to just to do a little aside on this, yeah. on on how this all ties um, together, how it's not just yeah. one particular area, and um, and also what we should say about um, not particularly well in some in some indigenous tribes or North American indigenous tribes, the the association with land yes. is different than. Um, I'm going to say a colonizer perspective. <laughs> yeah. And that, for sure. And that from when people came to the United States who mm -hmm. were not natives, it was to colonize, it's to get use out of, it's to, yeah. it, to settle. Yeah, to mm -hmm. settle, to, to, to extract things as opposed to live within. Yes. Um, and also, so that's been a little bit of a conversation as well, as far as like, how do we protect? this land in this way? How mm. do we, how do we, our associations with land, our associations with what belongs where, 
Yeah. Um, how does that impact you, this mm-hmm. conversation? I think I think this links back to your original point, your cold opening about <laughs> waste and, yeah. and yeah. things out of place because pipelines are very leaky infrastructures. There's yeah. no there's no pipeline that hasn't leaked. Right. We just don't hear about it. But it's like it can happen every day. Yeah. Um, and if you think about so I'm gonna pull out the geography here of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think about the 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 estuaries and the the drainage system Mm -hmm. that flows into the Atlantic Ocean, that's where we're talking about, right? We're talking about the wetlands. We're talking about the the rivers that are flowing into that space. um, And that's where the pipeline is going to be. And so if those are your waterways and those, Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any leakage, it's going to seep into the waterways, it's going to seep into the soil, and that stays there. And that's that matter out yeah. of place that becomes waste. It's no longer something that's transported by the pipeline. Right. But it's something that is become is degrading that space. Yeah. And if that is the land that is being claimed as part of an indigenous claim to space, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's being degraded. Yeah. It's yeah. devalued at this point. Right. Absolutely. So it's um the lobbying that happened with the pipeline is the kind of lobbying that you see everywhere you mm-hmm. see it in the case of the, the the dakota pipeline you see it in ecuador where i work mm-hmm. where uh, people understand that if you have those infrastructures next to you it will devalue your yeah. life and it will devalue the place where you live so mm-hmm. they will lobby to have it put elsewhere where voices are not as as strongly heard yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah actually um speaking of you're you're branching outside of North Carolina, which is perfect because yeah. actually we're gonna probably like open up the yeah. floor a bit more to you to talk about um, how does how would you say your research kind of or what you've learned kind of ties into this 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 idea of environmental justice. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is with oil, mm-hmm. and so infrastructures like pipelines or refineries mm-hmm. or even. Um, oil fields are places that I've studied and I have looked at where these places have been situated. A lot of it has to do with where the commercial oil is located um, and also who lives on those lands. Mm -hmm. And in in many ways, it mirrors the histories of settler colonialism in the United States and North America. Um, That that history of settlement and colonization is the history of the the Americas. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I think it often gets narrated as something that happened in the past, but actually it continues to happen. Um, One of the the groups of people that I have been working with is uh, uh, Afro-Ecuadorians in the province of Esmeraldas, which is in the coast Mm -hmm. of Ecuador. Um, and that is the siting of the largest state oil refinery in Ecuador. Mm. Um, it's no accident that the refinery is sited there. Um, of course, there are uh, geographical reasons. It's one of uh, it's accessible to the Pacific Ocean, so mm. it can be exported rather quickly to its main um, distribution centers, which are in Houston and in California, in um, uh, Northern California. But also because Esmeraldas uh, has been historically a site of black resistance and freedom fighters in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And so placing the refinery there was a way to establish a form of state settlement into that space. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that settlement is not only an economic and financial one, but it's also one that is a polluting one. Yeah. So refineries are extreme polluters uh, uh, because of the ways in which oil gets burnt mm-hmm. and the ways in which, uh, like I said, pipelines leak. So refineries yeah. are connected to the pipelines that are extracting the oil. Um, so um, what you call the rames, which are spills, oil mm-hmm. spills, are a regular occurrence in Esmeraldas. Um, and it's just, it becomes so mm-hmm. normal. Right. It's like, oh, there's just one more. And there's another one. Oh, there was a small one two weeks ago. Mm. Oh, that one was much larger. You know? <laughs> so um, they become events that are that are everyday based. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those, yeah. those accumulate. I'll, yeah. I'll also say I was in um, Ecuador this past summer mm-hmm. and 
I didn't know this about Esmeralda. Mm-hmm. And that like, uh, like I like when you said it was on the coast, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. And I remember when we had like our orientation of like places to visit mm-hmm. and they're like, don't go to this area because like there's, oh, you know. Dangerous. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what they yeah. said. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, and I'm like, oh, okay. And <laughs> like, like, I'm not gonna dig too deep into it. And hearing, hearing also that the dangerous area is mm-hmm. one that's having resistance to colonialization right. uh, is interesting yeah. to say the, to, to say the least um, so Esmeraldas is a place I mean it's, it's a very it, there are many things about mm-hmm. this place that are mm-hmm. very attractive um, uh, it has some of the best beaches yeah so I've heard that. during vacation time all the the people from Quito Mm-hmm. Uh, take their vacation time and they go right to Esmeraldas to the beaches and it's very mm-hmm. famous they're like nightclubs and like it's a great space to to be there's the food is great mm-hmm. um, but to go there often the most direct way is take the a road that passes right by the refinery mm-hmm. and there's so many people that don't notice the refinery because first they speak beat right by because mm-hmm. they think I'm not going to go through the city. This is horrible. I'm just going to make it to the beaches. And once I'm in the beaches, I'm fine. Um, but if you ever drive by the refinery, you smell it. Mm. And um, mm. especially when the winds die down. Mm. And so when, when the winds are circulating, it's like, oh, it's just like a faint smell of rotten egg and sulfur. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's how it's made on the city smells. But then when the winds die down, that's when you get a sense of what actually is being put out into the air. Yeah. And it's that it's like your your throat closes, mm-hmm. um, your nose and your eyes tingle. Uh, it's it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very embodied response to what mm-hmm. is being put out into the air. Yeah. So uh, in that space, it's uh, people try not to think about the Smirandas. They just mm-hmm. want to drive through and go to the beaches, but not necessarily think through the economic system yeah. that is in place. Oh, wow. But there's yeah. that thing again with, with environmental racism is yeah. they have the opportunity and the ability to continue driving and, and yes. to um, to not have to continue having that physical mm-hmm. reaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting to me that you, that you said you were told that it was like a dangerous yeah. uh, place, especially with our conversation about what constitutes um, waste and hazard. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it kind of just thinking about what what in that is is um like being considered see. hazardous and and who by whom and yeah yeah <coughs> and especially when like actually to go back to what you said when you say people from quito like mm. like the Cayambe coca area like they're like the rich people area <laughs> of quito <laughs> like from where, the valleys outside of quito <laughs> yeah like like where they visit like the suburban area because right. because like I, I really like having, I'm a global, you're a global citizen. Yeah, we're both like, global citizens. Yeah, yeah. what, what I really like about, when they say be a global citizen, I'm like, but what I like <laughs> about learning about different places is you realize you're not so much in the bubble mm. and that these, these oh, things. Oh, we're in bubbles all the time. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> True. But that like inequality, when you think of it in the United States, it's like, it's not just here. Like, mm-hmm. like, like these this metaphor these these dynamics mm-hmm. play out globally yeah and that the very rich people of the suburban areas mm-hmm. of quito don't want to see or acknowledge um what's happening there mm-hmm. the environmental injustice that's happening there and that the environmental ju- injustice is happening around minority communities right. around afro ecuadorians mm-hmm. and Ooh, ooh, and and you said you said something that you you said something, Gabe, and you also said something else, Gabby, about um, voicelessness. Yeah. And I've been more active on science Twitter, but I also <laughs> but I've also found like like uh, kind of like social justice Twitter, I guess, uh-huh. as well. And there is this tweet I'll cite him, Daniel Jose Older, who said, "There's really no such thing as a voiceless." There are only the deliberately silenced mm-hmm. or the preferably unheard. Uh, and it's, I don't know how to say yes. the name of Aru Hati Roy, I think is where Aru Hati Roy. Yeah, I think that's mm-hmm. where the quotes are attributed to. She's an Indian uh, writer and scholar. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, so, I think that that 
quote is so just so true. Yeah. Just so true. And that the 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 Afro Ecuadorians and also like the like the people who protest these things um, of environmental justice yeah. in the United States, they are protesting. They are voicing. They're mm -hmm. just not being heard. Yeah. Um, and I think when we think about environmental justice in the United States, I think it would be like a bit remiss not to talk about Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. um, and and how there are still like people. Every now and again, you'll see on Twitter, like other social media, like people in Flint still don't have clean water. Yeah. They still don't have clean water. Yeah. Like it, it was, it was a conversation for a moment, and it took time. Like it's yeah. not like when it first got to national conversation. Oh, this is when the crisis happened. It was happening yeah. before then, before it finally got national attention. And when it did, it just went away. Yeah. It's like the the like it doesn't go away for them, but for our conversation, it ties right back to what you said about memory. Yeah, what we remember. Mm -hmm. Um, we're driving by. <laughs> we're continuing yeah, to drive by. Or, yeah. or what we choose to just ignore mm -hmm. or to try to forget. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be harder and harder in time to. You can't forget something that is actively happening. Yeah. Climate change is real, <laughs> and it cannot be ignored, mm -hmm. um, especially on a global scale. The people who will be most impacted by it and who have maybe, I don't want to say the least ability to fight against it, but certainly are being put at the table to fight against yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's that duality of how, what do, what can we do yeah. if there's, if there's anything. And I think most importantly, it's just to acknowledge that these people are not voiceless. Just mm -hmm. listen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just listen. Um, and and why do we why do we think that these problems of environmental mismanagement occur so often around marginalized groups? Like what is what is the because like I said, it's not like oh, they just happen to be right, yeah. like pipelines are constructed. Yeah. Waste waste or landfills are placed somewhere mm -hmm. they're they're not part of this natural environment mm -hmm. we've yeah we've been um in and out of this i feel like mm -hmm. as, as we as we've talked about it but it's really it's such a cycle of um things like um being denied certain uh purchasing certain plots of land because of your race and then that land as generations go by it becomes maybe like unincorporated land or red zoned and then um governments won't um give as many uh government resources to those areas and then um people in those areas are then disproportionately affected by um things like the hurricanes and uh, the pipelines and then because they're not given as much resources and they don't have as many resources as well. It's harder to fight that generational trauma and then it continues. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's, it's so cyclical, which mm -hmm. is one of the, the largest obstacles um, of it all is, mm -hmm. is breaking the cycle. Um, yeah. Yeah, your question made me think about the scale uh, and the bandwidth that we have to appreciate the, those scales. Because mm -hmm. when you ask the question about the pipelines and the pollution, uh, you know, I immediately went to the scale of it's a system, right? Mm -hmm. It's an economic system that we can talk about it abstractly, but really it is very rooted in these everyday needs. You know, mm -hmm. we drive cars, we eat strawberries in the winter in North Carolina, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that feed a certain, a, th a certain quality of life that we've mm -hmm. become accustomed to thinking as this is normal. This is what, this is what I should be expecting to want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so to feed that, you need to create these infrastructures. You need to create the resources for it. Right. Um, and they are placed, I mean, they are about occupying and settling particular spaces mm -hmm. and those spaces are never empty. They've already 
the life already existed in those mm-hmm. places, right? Yeah. So it, at, at one point it gets so big that, you know, I sometimes feel like my bandwidth can only take and understand and be emotionally connected yeah. to some things. Yeah. Knowing yeah. that there are things I just can't catch into yeah. one thought, mm-hmm. right? And, and this, I think, is part of why we're not always able to grapple with the full picture mm-hmm. because we don't experience the full picture. We experience bits of it and we have knowledge mm-hmm. about different times and different moments and different spaces and different peoples where this is all connected. But we, we're not, I don't think we are always capable of taking it away. I think if we yeah. did, we would explode. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it reminds me, your question also reminded me of uh, of another experience that we had in Ecuador. Um, I have a colleague that I work with. Her name is Flora Lu. Mm-hmm. She's at the University of California in Santa Cruz, and we're long term friends. Like mm-hmm. our very first, my very first trip to the Ecuadorian Amazon was with her in 1999. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I was born then. I, <laughs> I know. I was, I was like. In the 20th century. <laughs> Back in the 20th century. Um, and we spent like seven hours in a canoe. And we did not wow. know each other. And by the time we were done with this canoe, I kind of felt like I know this person. I'm going to know this person for a long time. Mm-hmm. And we have. Yeah. Like over the last 20 plus years, we have been in conversation. Uh, she works. She has worked with the Waurani of Ecuador for a really mm-hmm. long time. And one of the things that struck us about the work that we do together um, is that we came to the realization that there are now youth and young adults among the Waurani who have never known life without oil. Wow. Right? So their ancestors or their grandparents knew what life was like before the oil companies came. Mm-hmm. But these people are dying. These people are already elders. Yeah. Um, and their children and their children's children have never known an Amazon that did not have an oil company in it. And yeah. I kind of thought, okay, that's that's an example of how how hard it is to grapple with the spaces that we live in, mm-hmm. right? How hard it is to grapple with why things happen the way that they do. It's because our memories are are we have one level of memory, which is at the personal level. Right. And mm-hmm. then we have the memory that is a long-term generational stuff that if mm-hmm. we don't are not accountable to that, we can't really act on our present. Yeah. What you said reminded me of so many things. <laughs> but yeah. I, 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 uh, uh, I think like a couple summers ago as part of like, how do we, like some like conversation about how do we get people like uh, interested in environmental change? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, Mm-hmm. like environmental movements and I read a book and it was talking about memory mm-hmm. of a particular community um, and it's so funny how memory is really brought up so often but it was brought mm-hmm. it was talking about how someone could remember their grandfather's grandfather grandfather so many years back they could recite the name but when it came down to women they couldn't they couldn't remember that because it was more of a patriarchal society that was like mm-hmm. like remembering men's name was just mm-hmm. a lot more important to that society um, and here where, because they just dominated the conversation of like, what is, what is worth remembering? And I think in the United States, we have like the people in power say the things that are worth remembering. Mm-hmm. And, and in this book, they, they brought up like for certain areas where like 20 years ago, they had like this terrible environmental disaster, but it changed. And it's like, people just don't remember mm-hmm. that the company told someone to put oil in the water right. because the company said later on, like, this isn't worth remembering. This is, I give my own apology. We made the differences and then we move on. And mm. it's like, we then just don't remember. We just, yeah. we just don't remember. Um, and also that there were like lakes on fire. Like there was yeah. so much smog and it changed. It's not like it can't not change, right. but we just, don't remember we don't yeah. and like we're just we're just saying again like epa rolling back certain regulations of like oh gosh, just yeah. like and it's going to happen again but we just don't remember because i think in our society we put a lot more focus on like as you said economic systems right. of just what's easier for this corporation what's mm-hmm. easier like they dominate this narrative of what is worth remembering mm-hmm. and what we value 
yeah, what we value. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes generationally of, of just what we choose to have in our conversation. I like people in um, Princeville, North Carolina, that I mentioned before, they're not going to forget. They're not because yeah. they're currently living within it. There has not been any change. It's part of their narrative of being there. But we can choose to forget them yeah. and not hear them and put them to the side and put them out of place and just tuck them away so that we don't have to deal with that issue. Right. Um, because we forget that it can happen to us. Yeah. We don't have that. <laughs> we don't have that bandwidth to realize that. Yeah. Global climate change is global. Mm -hmm. You are you, and now they're trying to colonize Mars. Like you can't, uh, <laughs> you, uh, yeah. like I don't think you have the time to be able to run away from this issue that is going to impact yeah. you. You're not going to be able to run away from it. Um, yeah. They yeah. certainly don't have time for me to complain about how much I hate the colonizing Mars thing. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I think it's cool to go to space, but like some of the. Some of the, uh, I, I think we need to, <laughs> uh, I, th I think we both have space to like, to space, huh? to like travel like outside and see the stars and learn about the world and also do things like here on earth, but we just choose not to. Like yeah. we really see it as like a dichom dichotomy of like, oh, let's just focus on that. Let's not focus on planet earth right here. It's kind of a goner. So let's just, and it's like, you know, we can do both, right? <laughs> like we don't, it doesn't have to be an and or a situation. And even the idea of colonizing. Yeah. Like even, yeah, Mars. <laughs> like honestly, I mean, part of it is because the idea of this earth mm -hmm. and how it's like at the brink of such change. Yeah sort of becomes the the impetus for like well we got to go somewhere else because mm -hmm. we're trash this i can't get the idea of trash <laughs> yeah but it's like this one's just not working you mm -hmm. know and the but it's i i like your point gabe about uh, the cyclical nature of things because mm -hmm. it would bring this back to our conversation about the epa mm -hmm. that was one of the moments that that was you know the survival of well, man, right, was the impetus for a legal framework at the state and federal level to talk about protection of environments, right? The question was not, are these environments going to survive? The question was, will man survive, right? right? Mm -hmm. And that became the, the channel for the EPA back in 1970. And I, like the 1960s was the, like, the formational moment, but... Mm -hmm. I don't, I, that master narrative, it just, it keeps on repeating itself, mm -hmm. right? And, and we can joke about it, but I think we can joke about it because we know there are elements of truth in it about sure. how we value and whose visions or whose values are being used mm -hmm. to determine how we act and what mm -hmm. our futures are going to look like. And social movements and environmental justice movements are saying, mm-mm. You know, yeah. that's not the story. That's not the narrative we want. This yeah. is not how we want to narrate our futures. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I and I like I like the ending of value. Values. Yes. What do we value? Which is why why for listeners why <laughs> I'm not of the 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 waste um yeah. sort of cold open, and that if. Waste is something that is disgusting, something that's filthy, something that's out of place, something mm -hmm. that is hazardous. Why do we put it around people of color? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do you put it around the most marginalized people? Mm -hmm. If if you associate, if that's your association with waste, what is your association with the people who are around it? Right. Um, sure. <laughs> so there's a new minor in environmental oh. justice <laughs> and geography. <laughs> Maybe I can learn more. <laughs> can you, for any UNC students that are listening, can you tell us a little bit about yes, that? Yes, we are so excited. We mm -hmm. being the geography department. <laughs> um, but anybody who wants to as well, mm -hmm. you're all included. <laughs> um, so yes, the geography minor is, an, the geography department is enrolling and unrolling a new minor mm -hmm. uh, in fall 2020, and it is an environmental justice minor. Um, it requires two core courses, which are taught in the department, and then there's a selection of courses that can be taken within the department or other departments are in our, there's a very extensive list, I can't tell you exactly mm -hmm. which are, but, but you can look it up in our catalog. And um, it is, it, the hope is that it fills the role of 
having these interdisciplinary conversations about like ethical and moral questions about justice mm -hmm. and these questions of why and then how do we know it and what do we do about it and how do we communicate and tell these stories mm -hmm. in ways that they reverberate in people's uh, relationships. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's pretty much what I have about the minor at this point. Yeah. Um, we do have two other minors. <laughs> 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 so this is going to be, well, uh, it has siblings. This minor has siblings. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, a younger, younger Yes. Yeah. Um, I am so, I am so upset that like the environmental justice minor is now. Because uh, you're like, graduating. Because I would have, yeah, I'm graduating. I'm like, I would have loved to, I would have, yeah. yeah. Um, But for those listening who like go to UNC, this is something that you could definitely think about. Mm -hmm. um, however, like you don't have to learn just about environmental justice in a mm -hmm. class, of course. Um, there's things that you can participate in, mm -hmm. that you can be a part of. Just having these conversations, one is like a great first step. And like there's value in that, just being able to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, and also that... Uh, I actually forgot what I was going to say. Midway through what I was going to say. All right. But um, <laughs> environmental just, oh, now I remember. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, also, when we talk about having a conversation, making sure that you are listening to those who are speaking yeah. about mm -hmm. their experience and who are the most marginalized because they are not voiceless. Yes. They are saying things out loud, mm -hmm. screaming, <laughs> And they have been doing it for so long. And honestly, it's not going to stop. Yes. It's not going to stop until there's change and until there's justice being enacted mm -hmm. and being um, and taking place. Um, and that requires acknowledging those voices and doing something with it. Mm -hmm. Mic drop. <laughs> Mic boom. <laughs> boom. Boom. I love how you say that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think we covered. I think, I think that was really that wrapped up nicely. Yeah, really All right. We thank you, Dr. Valdivia, for yes, being here today. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's the end of the episode. But hopefully, not the end of the discussion. <laughs> um, you can definitely research some of the points presented in this episode, and also feel free to shoot us an email at theuniversepodcast at gmail .com. That is the Universe podcast at gmail.com. We also have an Instagram. So, I mean, if you want to DM us, <laughs> you can do that. If you yeah. have any questions um, or any comments, or if you want to know more about any resources that we have, we had a couple of websites that went into uh, creating this episode. But if yeah. you have other resources or like back check us in it about anything, we yeah, definitely appreciate just, it. Yeah. Um, and, if you, and if you have any questions, they may get answered in a future episode. Yes, indeed. So this is Anna. And Gabe. And, and this is Gabby Valdivia. And with production by Morgan, stay first, y'all. Stay first.